So what country would you love to visit? What country would I love to visit? So, um... I, you know, I've, I've been to several countries, and so I've seen a lot of the world. Um, I have never been to, I've never been to Italy, I've never been to Spain. Um, I've always wanted to go to both of those places and just, you know, see kind of, I've never been to Greece, so wow. I've, I've wanted to go to some of those European countries and really just kind okay. of yeah, see yeah. what they're like, so. Um, How many countries have you been to in total? So I, I've been to somewhere around 40 countries. Wow, Mark. Yeah. That's like yeah. one a year, almost. That's right, yeah, yeah. So I need to get 41 while I'm 41. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so something like 40 countries. Uh, you know, I've probably been on like just as many different trips. Mm -hmm. So probably yeah, 35 to 40 trips yeah, overseas. Yeah, yeah. And so, right. um, yeah, I, so, so God has blessed me to be able to see a lot of the world. I, I remember when I was younger, when I was in high school, that like that was something that was in my heart to do. It was to... to to see a lot of the world and explore a lot of the world and, and by the grace of God I've been able to do that and it's it's been really a blessing and uh, the my, my one regret is that like I haven't kept as good of a record so like I wish I would have on each of those you know trips that I take overseas I wish I would have kept like a better um, you know even like a simple like log of like this is what I did on this day and you know saw these things but I just haven't kept those notes like I should have. And if I had to do it over again, I would have done that. But yeah, I've got to see a lot of the world. It's been been really neat and uh, seen a lot of beautiful places. But, you know, I still, I, I drive through Southern Illinois and I think, you know, this is a beautiful place. And uh, so I love being, it feels like home too. So I love being here. Yeah. yeah. So have you started logging some of your recent mission trips? So I guess it's easier now with, photos and videos yeah on phones and on the tap of your finger but yeah um you know probably the last couple of years i've i've actually i've taken probably fewer photos okay. because i've been going back to places that i've been before and i just haven't like thought about taking pictures so usually when i go to a new place i'll pull out the phone like mm -hmm. that would be one of the first things that i think about yeah but uh you know I, I don't really think about it as much anymore so but the good thing is is like when you go on a team like a lot of people take pictures and stuff like that so you, you, you still get pictures yeah, yeah. you just kind of savor it you kind of watch other people feel yeah. how you felt the first time that's right yeah that's right yeah. yeah yeah and that was the you know a few years ago my oldest daughter hallie went to ecuador with the youth team and i, I went along and so that was neat to just be on that with my oldest daughter and to really sort of experience a, a trip like that kind of through her eyes as as someone first traveling overseas so oh yeah that was neat yeah okay so how do you stay informed and up to date on global trends and issues that may affect the uh, mission trips you go on and then what resources do you rely on for information and guidance yeah um so I, number one i probably don't stay as up to date as i should um, I do a lot of times, like I have a Twitter account and I'll read Twitter. And the main reason I read Twitter is just for news. So I follow a lot of news sources. And so I'll just thumb through there. And if anything catches my attention, I'll, you know, maybe dive into an article or something like that. But there are ways to, to really keep up to date. So if you go to, I think it's uh, uh, um, travel.us.gov. Uh, Okay. I think it's the website. You you can go there, and for any country, really, you can get travel travel warnings or travel updates. So, like, if you're going to a place that, that it may be, like, questionable whether or not um, the, whether it's, like, the security situation or m maybe there's been, you know, maybe it's a place where there's been fighting or, or even during the pandemic there were a lot of things going on uh, on travel where they were giving warnings and stuff like that. You can sign up for... Um, updates and so when any like travel warnings or anything comes out it will automatically send those to you and you can keep track with 
like really how the the U.S. State Department is evaluating certain situations in different countries. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, what's your favorite musical artist at the moment? Favorite musical. Favorite artist. musician at the moment to listen to. Oh yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so, let me see who I've my last few searches here. So. I, I, honestly, I, I like I go through periods where I just listen to the same person for a few weeks, and then I'll just you know switch or something like that. Yeah. So, um, let's see. So one one uh, group that I've been listening to while I work out, they're not a Christian group, but they're called um, the Black Pumas. You guys heard of them? Mm, no, 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 I don't think so. So I've been listening to them when, when I work out. And then uh, my daughter, Hallie, created a worship playlist on my phone, so I listen to, to that uh, okay. occasionally when I listen to worship music. Okay. Um, I really love uh, Need to Breathe, so uh, I kind of go back to them pretty frequently. Um, I'm not sure if you guys like them. I've heard of Need to Breathe, yeah. yeah. Um, and then, uh, you know, I like Shane and Shane a lot too. So yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I like Andrew Peterson a lot. Um, that's all I can have, so. Yeah. Okay, what was that first group you mentioned that you work out to? I'll have to, we're going to so, do right the, the Black Pumas, and this album is what I, the one that I listened they, to. They did cover Black Moon Rising by, which oh, that's a different song. Yeah, it's a different one. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So we're going to the gym after this. I might, yeah, might have to listen to a couple tracks. Yeah, yeah. Add to the list, maybe. Yeah, they're good. Yeah. Yep. Okay. My next question is, so how do you involve? Like, he can already answer this, but maybe go in more detail. But how do you involve and equip your church members to participate in missions, and then what opportunities do you provide for training and development? Yeah. So that that is a great question. So. Um, I would say, like, the training and equipping that, that I've done in my role has been really kind of spotty, like, for the six years that I've been here. Mm -hmm. And I'm in the process of, of trying to be more consistent with that training. So um, uh, there's, there's a few things with that. So, like, Pastor Russ and I just taught an evangelism course. So we're going to do that at least once a year, maybe twice a year. And then I've also been developing, like, some more in-depth, discipleship and so um, I have a card here that I recently had printed up just you know with some missions contact info and then I've got a QR code That's on the awesome. back so I'm awesome. starting to hand these out to folks and uh, like when you go to this web page it has a link there where people can like sign up and let me know their interests for more thorough and more in-depth mission discipleship or discipleship okay. for mission mm -hmm. and so I've got that on there and just uh, you know my goal is to uh, um, I don't know how many people will be interested for for more in-depth stuff but my goal is just to, to really work through things with folks uh, and, and just get them more prepared uh, for the mission task and, and that will that will look different like if someone is is on a you know a team to Thailand maybe it would be some stuff that, that might specifically equip them for that team. Um, but if versus someone who maybe feels called to go to the mission field um, and live, so, so something like that would, would obviously be broader and kind of more, uh, more in-depth, kind of more encompassing than what like a mission trip training would look like. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, as you guys can see, like I've got a lot of books. I do, I do like to read. Actually, no, they can't. But if you're in here, like, to my left and right, there are tons of books. But yeah, so I've always no, I've noticed that with all the pastors we've interviewed, there's always like a big shelf of books. And it's weird enough, like Nathan's was probably the smallest out of. This is probably about maybe a little above average. Well, Na Nathan, uh, I think got rid of most of his physical books because he likes to read on Kindle. So. Yeah, that's what he said. He has a lot of books on Kindle. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, which I, I'm not really a big fan of reading on a Kindle, so I like no. to have the, the book in hand. And I've just recently uh, um, made the transition to, I try to read standing up. So, like, I've got some books up there 
uh, because it's so much better on my back and on my my hips. I've got lower back issues. Okay. So wow. When I get into a book and I'm just kind of slouched over in a chair, like I, I notice it in my back, and so okay. I try to stand and read now, which yeah. is uh, you know it makes for shorter spurts of reading, but it it's never. Good. Yeah. Yeah. So if you give three pieces of advice to college age adults, what would those pieces of advice would be? Yeah, um, so college folks, three pieces of advice. So, um, yeah, you know, you guys are college age. Yeah. Like, yes. you are really at, at such a formative period in your life. You, you've kind of gotten through, like, those high school those high school years yeah. where, you know, all the things that, that come with that. Um, and you're probably more focused on really like what you're going to do the rest of your life and then like preparing for that. And so making plans for that or, and, and so, uh, you, you know, they say at least spiritually people in college, they, they usually go one of two ways. So mm -hmm. they, a lot of times they've gotten more freedom from their mom and dad. And so like they're now kind of out on their own a little bit more than they were before. And so they either turn away from God and kind of pursue the things of the world or they turn toward God and realize how much they need him. And so, um, like, it, especially for college, it, so if you're, if you're one of those people that have turned toward God and you're now pursuing God, like, I, I would just be in prayer about, like, how the, the different gifts that God has given you, how you can most effectively use them for the good of the world and the good of the kingdom and because it, God is God has not put any of us here on accident mm -hmm. we're, we're all yes. here for a reason and God's created each and every one of us in his own image and he's given each of them every one of us a certain level of gifts and we need to use those gifts for the good of the world that we live in and for the good of the kingdom and so like just thinking through like like how can I right now at this like early stage this formative period how can I set myself on a trajectory that's going to then lead towards that? And so, um, yeah, uh, it, you know, I think a lot of people in college, they struggle with God's will for their life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, like, what should I be doing? And, and uh, what, like, where do I need to live? Who do I need to marry? What do I need to do? And so like one of the best pieces of advice that, that I've ever heard is, that you need to like with the you know think of prayer as like a spoon that's kind of stirring the mixture so with the spoon of prayer you need to stir together the mixture of like what you're burdened about and like when you look out at the world what the world most desperately needs and then what you're gifted with so your burdens your gifts and then the needs that you see in the world like you you stir those with the spoon of prayer and then God's going to use kind of those things together to, to help direct you and lead you. Yeah. Yeah. I like the spoon analogy. I, yeah. That's just really. You had two, right? Would you have a third one? What was the third one? Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, I would also, I would also say, you, you know, uh, start developing like healthy habits and stuff. You know at, at your age yeah you know? because it's easy to develop bad habits and like those bad habits can after they go on for a long time and you get to be my age it's a lot harder to undo them than it is at, at your age so so you know like healthy eating habits healthy exercise habits just healthy spiritual disciplines mm -hmm. you know just incorporating those into your life so so i think there's even good scientific research that would that would back this up but once you get like once you get up in your late 30s early 40s just kind of rewiring yourself for healthy habits is a lot harder to do than it is when you're at your age so yeah okay that's good yeah yeah, yeah. your college age listen to what you just said take it to heart i will i sure will okay so my next question is so how do you see the role of missions evolving in the future and what steps is Heartland taking to adapt and respond to these changes? 
Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so I think um, there are several things that can be said there. Number, so for, for the last, you know, maybe even 100 years, I would say uh, the West, especially the United States, has played an incredibly huge role in sending out missionaries to various parts of the world. So, um, you know, I, I've got some books on mission history up there. So if you were to read some of those books, uh, um, yeah, they're written from like, an American or Western perspective, and, and so they're going to be more about uh, American and Western missionaries. But really, a, a large percentage of the mission activity was like guys from America, girls from America, or, or guys and girls from you know the UK going to different parts of the world. And so I think what we're going to see in, in say the next fifty years is we're going to see like that change completely. And so. I do think, like, maybe people don't want to hear this, but I think, like, economically, the U.S. is declining. Um, so I think in 50 years, we will not be the, the largest economy in the world, and so we won't have the, the most money. And uh, we're not going to be the, the strongest supporter of missionaries in, in the world like we have been uh, for a long time now. And so uh, that's going to come from other places. And so... Um, I think also uh, missionaries are going to be sent out from places like um, China and, and uh, um, places in Africa. They're going to be going to other places of the world. So I've, I've got a really good friend. He was my college roommate. He now lives in Taiwan, and he is uh, training Chinese speakers to go and be missionaries in other yeah. parts of the world. And so uh, we're going to see a lot of missionaries being sent out of China to other places in the world oh, that's great. and so so things like that are going to happen and and I also think like you know people have challenged me on, on this opinion but I do think that the church in America um, if if trends are, hold true uh, trends over the last 20 to 30 years if they hold true like in the future I think the church is going to continue declining in America and I think, like, the culture is going to continue um, trying to, like, push the church more and more to the margins of society um, than, than uh, where it's at. The, the church, especially, like, in, in Paducah, where we're at right now, the church has been central to the culture. So the church has had a central place in people's lives. And, and I think the church is going to be forced out of that central place. It already is in, in parts of America. Yeah. And, and so that's going to happen for sure. And so I think, like, we as Christians, we're going to have to adapt from being, um, like, in a, like, culturally prominent position, where we ha how we have been in the past, to really a cultural minority position, is what our future is going to look like. And maybe even a persecuted position. Mm -hmm. And so, like, we're going to have to, like, what does church life look like when we're persecuted? Or what does it look like when... We're, we're just sort of a, a fringe group on kind of the edges of society. And so we're going to have to deal with that. Now, the good, the good thing is, is that there are Christians today in the world that are dealing with that every single day. And so, yeah. and, and they have been throughout the history of the church. Um, and, but I think also with that is, is you're going to see a, you're going to see something happen in the church that, nothing other than persecution could cause to happen. And you're going to see the church become the church in, in really an incredible way. Because I, I, I really think, like, when we look at the Bible, that God has designed the church to flourish under persecution. And, and when we look at church history, that's what happened. Uh, when we look at the, the church in, in the New Testament, that's what happened, is that the the more tense the persecution got and the more that society tried to like press, put pressure on the church the more that it, it grew and so um, so I do I do think like yeah on the one side of the coin like dark days are ahead because we will face persecution yeah. but on the other side of the coin like God is going to be with us yeah. and God is going to bless and God is going to use us so, so I think that's going to happen I also think then 
like we as Christians, we have to become more creative in the way that we do mission. So, um, you know, there are things going on in, in places throughout the world where, where Christians are already thinking about this. And so, like, you know, I've got a book on my desk called uh, Business for Transformation. So, like, th there is a trend in missions, that, and I think it's a good trend, like Christians from, you know, one country moving to another country and starting a business in that country. Like a re not not just like a cover business, not mm -hmm. just something that gives them an excuse to be in the country. Right. A real legitimate business that makes a profit, that employs people, that you know provides a legitimate service and and value for a certain location. Um, so I think, and and as I mentioned, I think it's a good thing. I think that's going to happen more frequently, especially in places that are harder for Christians to get into. Where if they come in with a business, they can come in and they can, um, you know, run a legitimate business. But then they can use their platform in that business. They can use it to bless people and they can use it to to show the gospel in love and deed to, to people. Yeah. And so I think it's, I think it'll be, an, um, like I think missions is kind of moving in that direction. So, so you know, part of that is like, um, what it means is, uh like if you like imagine that our church is sending out someone that we've trained to go and to plant churches well that person can take three or four families with them that you know maybe they're gifted in other areas they're gifted in business or they're gifted in certain aspects that can be applied to business and they can all go together and they can plant a church together and and, and so you've got a very well-rounded church planning team that can really connect with people in a, in a culture, in a society, in ways that just a single missionary going out could not do. Yeah. So. yeah. Yeah. We'll look back at this in 50 years and see how much, how accurate you were and see maybe where we're wrong. It's interesting to see 50 years from now, I wonder what people were predicting about now. It's, it's kind of crazy. To, it's kind of interesting to look at, think about what's going to happen in the future and yeah. what's going to change. Yeah, for sure. Hope I'm alive in fifty years. It'd be we all. I think we all will be alive then. Yeah, maybe not me. Yeah, you'd be what ninety one. Ninety one. That's possible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, what fact about you would surprise many of your acquaintances? Yeah, um, that's a tough question. Uh, there's a few routes I could go with that. So, um, and, and a lot of it would be like acquaint, acquaintances at what stage of life. So, mm -hmm. like, I would say that the, the people that I went to high school with, especially like my friends in high school, they may have like one view of me versus like what people see now. And not that I, like, like not that my personality has changed or not that I was. I've, I've even really dramatically changed a lot, but, um, you know, I mentioned earlier that I was an athlete in high school and college, and so, yeah. like, like when people meet me in a church setting, they think, you know, oh, he's, you know, he's very kind and soft-spoken and laid back, so, so that's sort of the impression that people would get, and, you know, if you didn't interact with me in other settings, that, that may, may be your impression on me, but, like, like being an athlete in high school and college, I, I was also very competitive. And so like, there's a whole like really competitive side of me as well that, uh, um, you know, even though I'm not really athletic anymore or an athlete anymore, it hasn't gone away. And so, yeah. Uh, yeah. And you play, was it baseball? Is that right? For people who didn't, don't know on Facebook. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So, so in high school, I played baseball and football and then in college I played baseball. Yeah. yeah. Right. He's a fellow Massac Patriot alumni along with us too. So. And Nathan. And Nathan. That's right. Yep. Yeah. Were you class of yeah. two thousand or ninety nine? I was two thousand. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And and also, you know, kind of I don't know how related it is to that, but I'm also like like just naturally I'm a risk taker. Now, I feel like God has tempered that over the years. And God's kind of curved, like, based on some risks that I've taken that, you know, haven't worked very well. 
like I'm probably not as much of a risk taker as I used to be. And really my wife has also tempered a lot of that as well because she's not a risk taker. And uh, um, she doesn't like it that maybe that I am at all the time. So, uh, but yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm a risk taker. And uh, um, so, you know, that's part of the part of who I am too, that maybe not everyone would realize. Yeah. yeah, so who's your favorite author? Um, <clears throat> my favorite author. Uh, that's a great question. There's so many books up here. There's... So I'll just point out a couple that I have probably learned from the most. Let me pull the books yeah. off. So, yeah. so this guy was... Uh, he was also a professor of mine, um, had him for a few classes in seminary, uh, Don Carson, D.A. Carson, so just incredible. Uh, he's retired now. Uh, when did he retire? He retired like two or three years ago. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So just an incredible New Testament scholar and, and theologian and just a really good writer. Uh, has really kind of been formative and like how I approach the scriptures and, and the Bible. Uh, so I really like him a lot. Um, and where'd you go to seminary at? Uh, I went to seminary at Trinity uh, Evangelical Divinity School. Right here. Okay. Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. So, uh, yeah, it's, you know, it's known, it's also called TEDS. It's in the northern suburbs of Chicago. So we spent a few years living up there in Chicago. So, um and then I also really like this guy, uh, Greg Beal. Um, so uh, he's very much very similar to D.A. Carson and uh, like in, as far as his approach to the Bible. So, so both of these guys would be really big on what's called biblical theology. It's not biblical theology as opposed to unbiblical theology, but it's, biblical, it's called biblical theology as... Actually, there it is right there. New studies of biblical yeah. theology. So yeah. it's called that just to distinguish it from what's also called systematic theology. So they're just different ways of approaching the Bible. So like it, uh, I've got some books on systematic theology and, and that would be like what does the Bible as a whole say about who God is? And so it tries to give you a whole Bible answer. Like God is this, God is uh, you know, God is love, God is just, God is, so it's giving you Bible, whole Bible answers, and it's giving you verses to support it. Well, biblical theology looks at, it would look at, at like, from Genesis, starting in Genesis, ending in Revelation, how does the Bible unveil who God is, like, as the scriptures progress? So, like, how is the doctrine of God formed, like, through the Bible as a whole? And so, um, so you, you see a lot of more of the contours of the Bible when you approach it that way than just kind of giving you like whole, like systematic answers. So that may not make a lot of sense uh, um, in, unless you see it in action. But but that's really the, one of the main reasons I, I like these two guys a lot. And then um, a guy that's maybe slightly more controversial that I really like a lot, and I, I, I certainly don't agree with him on everything, but I think he's an incredible... It, He's a brilliant scholar, incredible writer. Is a guy named Inti Wright, and so, uh, yeah. um, so you know, I have a five-volume set of, of his on uh, the New Testament and Christian origins, and or, uh, and so uh, it's basically like his, you know, his largest work. And so, like he, he's a guy that, <clears throat> like one of the reasons I appreciate him is in the 1900s, there is a group called the Jesus Seminar. And so the Jesus Seminar basically took the New Testament and they tried to strip it away of its like um, divine origins. You know, they, they tried to humanize Jesus. Jesus was not God, he was just simply a human teacher. And so, you know, part of what they put out was a thing called the quest, the quest for the historical Jesus. So like, who was Jesus really? Uh, you know, they, they try to say, let's throw out everything that Christian history has taught us or that the Bible that Christians have believed for hundreds of years, and let's, through our academic study, let's come, let's discover who the real historical Jesus was. Well, N.T. Wright has been one of the biggest opponents, like biggest p 
for people fighting against and writing against the quest for the historical Jesus. So, so, and, and he's like incredibly, incredibly brilliant. And he is a like prolific author, just, you know, can put out books like that. And, uh, um, just a really good writer. And so like, I really love him because of that. And because he, he claims to be a historian. So he's writing from a historical perspective, like what was the world that Jesus lived in? What was it like? And then what was it like for Jesus to then come into this world? And, and how would they reverse receive Jesus when he first came into the world? And what, would, what were all of those things like? So, yeah. Yeah, so five books that you would recommend to 18 and 25-year-olds. Yeah, uh, so number one, um, I would, there's a book by John Piper. It's been around for a while called Don't Waste Your Life. So I don't know if you, you've heard of that. Uh, don't Waste Your Life by John Piper. I would recommend that. Um, <clears throat> let's see what else. Um, so another book that I would recommend to anyone who is serious about both the Bible and missions like is this book. Uh, Paul, missionary theologian by a guy named Robert Raymond. And so this has been like one of my favorite reads on uh on missions and it's like it's heavily like it's it's really bible based so a lot of mission books are kind of you know dealing with you know like what's going on in the world of missions right now yeah. what should we be doing um like he's like really going into like the life of paul like from the bible and just kind of writing about paul in the bible and like the different things that happened the different missionary journeys that he went on and so uh, it, it's really good. I really like that a lot. Uh, it's really kind of a, a heavy read, though. So uh, <clears throat> that may be a, a little bit uh, difficult. Let's see. What else? Um, Those uh, are two different books. I usually sometimes get some repeats. That was are two different books, though. I'll have to add those to my list for sure. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, let's see. This is a really good book. Oh, and this guy is, is probably one of my uh, favorite authors as well. Now, there is a part of this book that I would say don't waste your time on, and it's the first part because it's very, like, academic and technical. Um... But when you get into part two of this book, it's really rich as far as like developing like your understanding of the Old Testament. And okay. So, and just really how. So so one of the things that that like that really interests me is how the Old Testament and New Testament fit together. So oftentimes we just see them as like really two separate uh, sections of the Bible. Like one was, you know for old times and the other one is for new times and so but they actually are like they're two parts to a whole and so they they fit together god god as the author of the bible has so like authored them to support each other and and so like like he deals with that you know some of the, the theological themes in the old testament and like how they're pointing towards things in the new testament so so that's really good. Yeah. Um, let's see. Let me f grab a couple of books that maybe are uh, maybe a few books on missions. Let me see. I've got some here that I recently got. Let's see if I would recommend any of these. Um. So, this one reminds me of a book that I have over there called, um, what is it called? It's called Jesus Muslim Friend, I think. But so, like, anyone that's interested in Muslim evangelism, mm -hmm. um, I'd recommend that. This was obviously on Muslim evangelism. Um, like, anyone, anyone interested in missions, I would... I would definitely recommend anything from this guy, uh, Roland Allen. Okay. So, uh, Roland Allen is, he's been dead for a while, but just an incredibly influential 
author. Uh, he has so he, yeah, he has a book called The Ministry of Expansion, but he also has a book called uh, it's called Ministry Methods Saint Paul's or Ours, where he basically goes into the Apostle Paul and he's saying like how did Paul do missions? So a great question because mm. Paul is you know one of the greatest missionaries in Christian history. So how did Paul do missions? So he's going to look at that. So something like that. Uh, I would also recommend uh, A.W. Tozier okay. to anyone as well. So Tozier, uh, The Pursuit of God. Um, he has a few books that are just really kind of worth your time for sure. They're, cl they're classics and they'll, they'll be around for a long time because they're so good. Yeah. Um, Yeah, uh, I don't know if that's five. Oh yeah, that was, that, that's it is we got a couple money. additional ones. We definitely yeah, got our money. money's worth on that question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, what's your favorite? And this is the, this is one of the last questions. So, what's your favorite movie of all time? <laughs> My favorite movie of all time. Well, so my favorite types of movies are like spy movies or. Or you know any type of I, I like action movies and I like I like spy movies and I like heist movies. Okay. Um, so uh, what is a, a good spy movie? Well, the the Jason Bourne series is really good. Okay. Uh, by, have, you ever, have you seen the movie Spy Hard from 1996? I don't know if I have. Is that good? It's not, yeah, it's it's not, not that good. It's, it's decently not that good. good. <laughs> Spy. Is it a comedy? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think yeah. I know what you're talking about. <laughs> I don't think I've seen it. Oh, that it's surprises so me. Yeah. Um, I do, I really like high smooth, so I used to. When I was younger, one of my favorite movies was The Saint, with Val Kilmer was in it. That's a TV show. No. Yeah, it's now. Yeah. yeah. It, it was a movie, though, in Val Kilmer. Yeah. I think it was actually, there was a, actually an older version, even before the Val Kilmer Yeah, version. that's what you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, I really like that. Uh, I also really liked a heist movie when I was younger called Hudson Hawk with Bruce Willis. And uh, the... The bad thing about that, though, is I've gone back and I've watched it as an adult, and I didn't like it that much. I thought it was too mm. cheesy. So, yeah. So uh, there's a few movies like that. Yeah. Uh, growing up, I really liked Beverly Hills Cop, like that series. That's a good one. And I've gone back and I've rewatched those, and I really enjoyed them the second time. There's going to be a fourth one coming out the next year. Really? Yeah. Eddie Murphy um, and Judge Reinhold are reprising their roles. Yeah. Jessica gordon Levitt, um Joined in, joined in the the new the the Beverly Hills Cop Four. Wow! Yeah, I have to look for that. You know, it hasn't come out yet, Mark. A series I recently watched that I didn't really know anything about. So, like two weeks ago, uh, I over you know four or five days, I watched all three of the first ones. Was John Wick? So, have you guys seen any of those? No, I'm not. So I. Like, I didn't know anything about them, and I just, you know, put it on, and, uh, because I, I saw where the fourth one came out at the theater, Yeah. and I really liked them, I really enjoyed them, so they're, they're really well done, so, John Wick is an assassin, so, yeah. but it's not like a normal assassin movie, so there's this, this whole, they build this whole assassin's guild thing, and, like, the assassins all have, like, rules that they have to follow, I guess, or an assassin, and so there's, there's a hotel called the Continental, and when they're inside the Continental, they can't kill anyone. And, like, they can't fight against each other. It's just like a, you know, like a um, sanctuary. Okay. They go in. And they have to, if, if they break any of those rules, they'll be, like, exiled from the assassins. And, and you know. So it's, it's an interesting show. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. So we have one final question for Mark, unless we get some in the live stream. But we have plenty of questions ready. Here's the final one. What are some additional comments you want to make? Is there anything else that you want to talk about or touch upon that 
we haven't asked you or something you just want to mention something that comes to mind um uh, you know i can't really think of much but i do want to thank you guys for having me on you're welcome here. man i yes. pre really appreciate you guys and like the way that you guys do this and and i think you guys are doing an incredible job at it thank you thank you man i appreciate it's it it's really neat to yeah, see yeah yeah yes we finally have all the heartland pastors on the honey homeboys episodes so we finally got so nathan russ we had Brian was at second. Brian, Glenn, Jeremiah, Nate, Nate, and now you. So we finally got them done. Let us know who we should do next, and we'll see. We'll see what we'll do next. Yeah, we'll play it we, we have plenty more planned for the summer coming up real soon. The next few months. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Two-year anniversary coming up in a couple weeks. Two so. weeks. Yes. All right, AC, you want to wrap things up? Sure. All right, thank you everyone for enjoying the video and keep going, growing. Happy wiggling. See you guys.